Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the latest edition of the Woke Bros. Of course, I'm your co-host, Big Waz, and I'm joined by Nando Vila out by the beach, out there on the west side of Los Angeles, as always, looking sun-kissed and tanned as ever. But we got a very special episode today, man. Um, been, been knowing this brother on the internet for a minute now. Uh, my man, JP Ma, he's a journalist at large here in Southern California. He's also the author of this book right here. It's called Right Wing, What I Saw, Heard, and Learned Working in President Donald Trump's Favorite Newsroom. Go get that wherever you get your books. Amazon, all that good stuff. We're going to put the link in the show notes and all that. Um, JP, man, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm real excited to be here. I've been listening to you and, and Nando and um, back when Michael was was with us for, for years. So I'm real excited. That means a lot, man. Thank you. Thank you yeah. for coming on. Um, first, man, tell the people a little bit about yourself and your background so they can just get a sense of why it is you wanted to even attack this subject matter. Yeah, um, I'm a journalist. I went to college up in Sacramento, did a journalism program, a two year program, started at the local newspapers up there, your basic stuff, showing up to a football game, seeing if mm -hmm. I can get paid. Mm. Wound up producing TV, and I've been down in San Diego for almost five years now. And wow. I got so I came down to San Diego. This this job that I wrote about in the book was my first job here, yeah. and I spent about a year there, and it was a crazy experience. So I, I thought it was one that people who watch news should read. Whether even if you're not mm. on like one end of the spectrum, if you if you watch any TV news. I think this book will be pretty useful to you. Okay, JP, and was this? But wait, yeah, this, ahead, was this like was this like a sting operation, or or you just like you just needed a job to like pay the bills? <laughs> yeah, uh, so, or a um, bit of both. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> like, um, you know. It's in the first. Chapter. Hold on, before before we go on, yeah, let's ahead. just let's so the listeners to flesh this out for the listeners. Yeah, yeah, we need to, we need to explain the, what this the, is. the new station that you went to go work for is called One America Network. Most people call it colloquial, colloquially. I, I fucked that up. You know they all call it own. It. O -A -N -N. O -A -N -N. Yeah. Okay. Um, and it, like it's 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 not Fox. It's to the right of Fox. Right. It's yeah, probably no, it makes to Fox the right look of like it makes yeah. Fox look like the fucking you know the Communist Party. Uh, yeah, New now, Republic. Uh, the, yeah. The, the Fox yeah, might yeah. as well be. Yeah, yeah, they might as well be. Yeah, Karl so, Marx. So to your point, to your both of your point, a lot of my former peers at OANN, when when they wanted to move left, they wind up at Newsmax. Okay, nice. so Newsmax nice. is the one directly. <laughs> <laughs> and the people listening to this, they if you don't know what Newsmax is, again, another arch conservative publication, right? And so you go from Sacramento, you get a job at OANN. Um, right. And please, and again, like this is about as right wing as he gets in media. So uh, please uh, get back to Andrew, uh, what Nando had asked you. Yeah, so um, I'm sure you guys know in, in media, journalism, People get laid off a lot. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So I got laid off, I think it was November 3rd, 2017. And uh, one of my boys that lives in San Diego came home for Thanksgiving. And he was like, why don't you come back with me? Just drop your resume off some places, see what happens. And um, OANN basically hired me on the spot because I knew how to write. And Wow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so so this job came to you just as a, in an in an area of need, right? Uh, exactly. which I which I find fascinating honestly, JP, and I know you track some of this in your book and anybody who's paying attention to media gets it, but like you came at this as this is somewhere where I want to work. There was no uh, this is a, you know, a mission for me. This is some type of virtue or vocation. It's just like straight up like it's not a calling, I should say, because no. I think a lot of people in traditional, especially like, you know, like the prestige print media, a lot of those people will fancy them pe themselves as following a calling. Like right. this is like something that almost like joining the priesthood. 
no cap, right? Yeah, like they, yeah. they're becoming a journalist because they are performing a duty to society. Right. Um, yeah. You're saying you didn't come to this job that way. Not this particular job. I'm, I've been passionate about writing since I was a kid, but mm. I, I was in a situation where I needed a job and, you know, I had a certain list of skills. So I, it, I leaned in a certain direction with my search, but now I've, I wanted to live in San Diego and this was a way to get the rent paid. How, and um, did you know anything about OAN before starting there? No, <laughs> I called, I called <laughs> my dad and told him, like, you know, I got a job and, you know, I'll, I'll be down in San Diego for the foreseeable future. And I told him where and he was familiar with it. And he just kind wow. of said, like, good luck, you know, like. <laughs> Keep your head yeah, on. Just to give people, just to give people an idea, like I just went on the OAN, OAN homepage, and the top most shared article is a uh, One American News investigates Biden's secret flights, <laughs> and then the blurb <laughs> says it's a video, and the blurb says plane loads of migrants are arriving in the dead of night to a city near you. Join OAN's Caitlin Sinclair as she exposes the magnitude of the Biden administration's secret night flights. And illegal immigration transportation program. Yeah, good stuff. Yeah. So, so describe to the people the sort of environment or cult culture, if you will, upon arriving to OAN, and basically how you receive that personally, just yeah. stepping into it. So, uh, I'm sure both of you will recall um, when Roy Moore was running for that open Senate seat about five years. Yeah, ago. that was was that yep. Alabama. Alabama, yeah. yeah. So, and with the, um, with the young underage girl, he allegedly yeah, fucked this right. crazy so, like that. Several, I'm, several. I'm training. Oh, several. Okay. I'm training at this time. It's like my first three days on the job, and the owner of the network walks into the newsroom and says, "Roy Moore won the election. Put it on air now." <laughs> <laughs> that, that was my first experience there. Um, and of course, we know Roy Moore lost the election. Yeah. So there's, there's, uh, yeah, I, I get into that pretty early on in the book too. And wait, what, what did you, what did you, you just did you, did you do it, or what did you say? Um, you were really like, well, I don't. Yeah, know. I was still training at that time, and mm -hmm. I, I wrote hard news. Um, they're definitely, I mean, it's no secret what kind of network they are, but you can't get on the air unless you do have some kind of baseline, you know weather business you know stock market that yeah. kind of thing so and I, and I made it clear when I went in for the interview like I'm not putting my name on anything crazy and you know mm -hmm. they need to be staffed so there there were some spots for like middle of the road writers there right that's yeah. mostly what I stuck to and so describe what it was like to sort of hit the ground running on your work over there um like how did you approach what was being asked of you and um you know obviously because we all have jobs right we know what our bosses ask of us and then we know how where we want to take it and how we want to do it describe that process over there for you yeah so i didn't interact with the higher ups directly too much um the experience was mostly interesting so you i would go in to write and there are a lot of people in there like me who needed work um and we would kind of discuss how we would handle certain things when we were asked to do things that made me un uh, us uncomfortable there were people who were very passionate about the very right-wing stuff mm -hmm. and they would take initiative there so a lot of us would just kind of fall back um every once in a while you'd get pulled into something um and again, you just do your best to be responsible. Um, I never, I was never forced to write anything crazy, like me personally. Um, I know some of my peers felt like they were like coerced into that kind of thing. Um, yeah. None of them spoke on record with me about that in the book, but mm -hmm. I, I got enough confirmed that I could relay that to the readers. I want to... Oh, go ahead, Nato. Go well, ahead. just and uh, how did it work? Was there like a you know? Because I, I used to work in 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 the news department. I worked at Univision News, uh, mm -hmm. Spanish language news news station. Yeah. You know, um, spicy you know, news like, station. Huh? Yeah, dude. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a, yeah, like a spicy tamale. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, 
<laughs> and we had like you know a daily uh, editorial meeting and things like that like where the news director kind of you know everyone pitched stories and then you know that person would be like yes no this that the other like maybe get this that like one in the morning one in the afternoon like is that kind of similar yeah. similar structure and yeah a and typical was structurally it was a t conventional newsroom they populated the show the same way with you know the rundown program editorial meetings I news. news. We used ENPS. Oh, so, yeah, the the other one. Um, yeah. But yeah, I've used iNews too. But yeah, we had those meetings. Um, mostly, the the ownership and management would set the general tone of what the coverage would be, and then the producers would assign like as they saw fit, and they knew who they trusted to write certain stories and who probably to keep like in the in the middle so to speak um the ownership the herrings the, um robert herring senior owns the company had personal relationships with a lot of politicians um they would come to into the studio do one-on-one -on -one interviews i in the book mentioned there were confirmed like campaign contributions on multiple cases so with his relationships and his like right wing politics he would pretty much set the tone like the producers knew like what direction to go there that not a lot of direct initiatives needed to be issued i want to get your i want to get your thoughts on just as your own purview as somebody who lives in san diego because i think this place being situated in san diego is meaningful yeah. um because outsiders of california seem to think of california specifically Southern California, as this like liberal, crazy, hippie, commie, bastion, safe haven, where it's all these tie-dye wearing, dreadlock having white people, where I happen to know, because I happen to know some people from San Diego, like San Diego can be pretty fucking conservative, man. Yeah. Um, And talk about the San Diego portion of it all and why it was important that this place could happen in san diego yeah so in san diego like you said um not what most outsiders think of california it's heavy military presence a lot mm. of old a lot of old money the most segregated city that i've ever like personally experienced um wow you don't like being a black person you don't run into black people on accident here um mm. so you tend to be at a certain so there's not a lot of black people in la jolla no not at all <laughs> <laughs> i saw top gun you know top yeah. gun is in san diego <laughs> there's no black people yeah. there i think there was but, a black guy in the new top yeah. gun yeah, I think yeah and there's there. very specific neighborhoods where you encounter people of different ethnicities immigrants whatever you know like it has all those california elements but in san diego they're very like partitioned so to speak yeah, and then, you know, you have a lot of another thing that people don't realize about California as well is that they're like Mexican people who are like third and fourth generation. Right. Um, and that happens a lot in a place like San Diego. And guess what? Those homies don't always necessarily have the politics that you would assume that they did. No, um, I would say the. I don't know. I don't know which uh, term people generally prefer to use. Latinx, um, mostly Mexican in, in San Diego, but we mm -hmm. do have El Salvadorian, Guatemalan too. Mm -hmm. But a lot of that community is also very conservative. They're mm -hmm. pretty heavy in the military too. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of them kind of make that American dream work for them and climb climb the social ladder. And you know, they live they live in La Jolla too. So. <laughs> we're, and how are the how are the um, demographics of of the workforce at OAN? Yeah, um, yeah. great um, question. Majority white and trended much younger than I would have assumed mm, uh, going in there. Um, a lot of people in their mid twenties. Um, I was twenty seven at the time going in there. A lot of people right around my age, recent college graduates, and I think that's because with the kind of network OAN is, a lot of people with good reputations just won't go there. Um, yeah. So when you're a young journalist, <laughs> like you, if you go there, like I had a, someone I would call a friend. Um, I don't really know him much outside of work, but we were friendly at OANN. He was fresh out of college, um, didn't want to do the whole small market, five years, big market down yeah. the road thing. 
came to San Diego, spent a couple years there, established himself, and he's a foreign correspondent now. So it, it is wow. a way to kind of skip the line, so to speak. Yeah, pe people don't realize just, you know, if you want to be in broadcast news, I mean, the, 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 it's a long path in a at a time when the industry is kind of contracting, right? Yeah. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like, it's like you, you start off in, yeah, like, Reno, Nevada, you know, and then you yeah. move up to uh, like, you know, there's like late, there's like tiers yeah. of cities, you know, yeah. well, come um, come and then you're like, and then you might get a job in Chicago or something. Yeah. And right. then you're like, um, but you're bouncing around the country to these random ass places. Um, whoever will give you a job. Um, yeah. In, and, in and Sacramento, a lot of my college peers would go to places like Reading or Reno, like because they're nearby. Mm -hmm. Then you can come back to Sacramento after a couple of years. Then maybe you wind up in like a San Diego's like market 26, like that kind of thing. So it's, it's a long arc. Can you give people a sense of the money available at OAN, right? Is it a shoestring operation? Does it feel well-funded? Was money constantly uh, a problem talked about? Like, did they operate as like a startup or a little engine that could, or did they seem to have some type of, some type of means because I say this because like, and we can say this, right? Something like Jacobin mag, mm -hmm. right? Who that's our friend. Boscar is our homie. Right. Um, they can only do so much as a left of actual left wing propaganda machine, right? Like mm -hmm. there's only but so much that the Jacobin can do. Um, what would you say? Because like you could just walk up and get a fucking full time job over there. Right. What's your sense of the money involved at OAN? Um, I'm not gonna act like I've seen their books, but mm. for a a network to be broadcasting nationally and not underneath the umbrella of a CBS and NBC, very impressive. Like when we were mm. in the newsroom, it didn't have all the bells and whistles as some of the three letter networks that I have worked for, mm -hmm. but for, for anyone else to start something like that, it would probably take them like a decade I, in just my opinion to get yeah. to the level that OAN is with. with and if people with, wanted to say television. travel, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. get shit expense and shit like that to do yeah. the job, they, right. there were resources available. Yes. We had reporters and correspondents who traveled around the country. Yeah. Um, several people, full-time jobs. Um, mm. I was able to support myself in San Diego. It's a very mm. expensive city. So yeah, they, they got like some paper, said, not all the bells and whistles of the big networks, but right, it's not going to be CNN, impressive. but yeah. they, they got some paper. Very impressive. Nando, you were saying, no, yeah. I mean, I, I, I just, cause the, you know, the kind of sitting at a desk and just talking about the news is, is relatively inexpensive, especially if you don't have like, mm -hmm. you know, Miss millionaire hosts like Chris Cuomo or whatever it was at CNN, but just kind of sitting around and talking and booking guests via remote or all that stuff, relatively cheap. Uh, the hard part, the, the expensive part in, in a news operation operation is like those, those enterprise stories where you go out in the field and you're, you know, mm -hmm. you send a crew and the camera the and like hotel you might not get, bills. Woo. The meals. Yeah, oh. might, yeah. Well, so you might not get the story or you might right. not get, but you said that you're taking down. a lot of flyers on yep. stuff that, yeah. you know, and maybe it takes like a week or two to, to really get it right and all that shit. Um, editing and all that, that that's expensive. And like, so that's when you can, if they're doing a lot of those kind of packages, then you really know that they're, they're being well funded. So like, how much did the programming sort of split between just kind of sitting around being like, Hey, Biden did something crazy today, huh? Versus like, Hey, let's toss to, you know, Jack in, in whatever yeah. he's on the scene. Um, the, the basic newscast was very bare bones, um, just reading scripts with an anchor, but they had a lot of access. I don't know if that's because of the ownership's maybe prior relationships. I know he had money before he started the <laughs> network, um, but they had a lot of sit down interviews. Uh, I believe Mike Pompeo while I was there, nice. Roy Moore during his campaign. Wow. Um, during the California governor's race, a few of the Republican candidates came in. Like they, they seemed to have access while I was there. And I want to, I want to ask you. You get to this place, you're applying your trade, mm. trying to get a leg up in this business, like the rest of us. And what was you say is the first time you were like, 
I'm working at a different type of news operation than I might have thought I had signed up for. Can you describe for us? Give us a scene of where you were like, okay, this, this, these crackers might be out of their fucking minds. Different, yeah. So I told you, like day three, um, the owner comes in and says, "Report something that is isn't true, untrue." Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I would say the. I'm gonna try to give you one that isn't in the book. Okay. Um, I remember during the California governor's race, I believe it was 2018, a candidate, I'm trying to remember his name, but there were two candidates, Republicans, that were visiting OAN during the campaign. And one of them got an in, got a big endorsement. Um, and immediately the, the, you could see the tone of the, the coverage of that race change. I overheard discussions of campaign contributions like in the newsroom that's that's the biggest difference um in my experience those kinds of conversations um like i've worked for abc cbs and nbc you don't hear the real no. power how power players in the newsroom discussing business that way um at oann we knew who the ownership had relationships with who might be coming by um when he flies out to DC, whose office he might be dropping by. Like we we knew these things because they were fairly open about it. Yeah. And I want to ask about distribution because I know I remember like a few months ago, I think it was like maybe like in May or April, um, there was kind of like a liberal movement to get like uh, you know, satellite providers like direct TV or direct TV. Does ATT own direct TV? I think direct TV dropped them. I'm not uh, here. It's recently been reported that Verizon about to drop their asses. Uh, they put a video yeah. out crying about it. The Steinberg yeah. chick uh, was crying about it on video. Uh, <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Nando. With the that's, a, like, that's the hard part about a cable channel is distribution. Is like how many, you know, like if you have cable at your house and you have DirecTV, it well, it has certain channels, and sometimes they they don't have all the channels. They have, you know what I mean? So, um, or or Verizon FiOS or. Uh, Comcast or whatever provider you have, like these, the, the channels have to come to an agreement with the distributor. Uh, and if the channel isn't distributed, then no one can watch it and it kind of dies. So um, I, I know that DirecTV dropped uh, ONN in, in, in April, but like, was there, was that ever like, you know, talk about that or, you know, Hey, we're, we're now in, in this many million homes because we're, we got a new platform or whatever. Like, right. I remember, I imagine that must've been a big issue. Yeah, so in 2018, I actually remember during a staff meeting, ownership was was pretty excited about where they were, how many homes they could access. They were trying to expand to some digital platforms at that time. Um, so yeah, they've. Be, I think because of January 6th, a lot of companies are re-examining their relationship with places like OANN. But while I was there, they were they seemed to be growing. Um. I want to get into the book. Uh, I think I feel like there's a lesson you're trying to teach folks about the media. Actually, before I get into that, before I get into that, because it, it, it's related to what's in the book. Um, mm -hmm. I think in in media, there's always a hyper awareness of what the other people are doing, right? right. Like I can remember when we were at the athletic. Being like, oh shit, the ringer did X, Y, and Z. Oh shit, uh, Bleacher did X, Y, and Z. Oh shit, did you see that shit at SB? Whatever, right? Like that was the case. How aware were you guys in of other people's coverage, and how did that sort of manifest itself in how you guys delivered your product? Um, it didn't affect the product too much. Mm. Um, Sometimes locally, because we were in San Diego, you might get some big military news or gotcha. there was a local congressional race. We pay attention to how our competition was covering that. But we're we're a national network surrounded by I say we I'm not there no more, but we were a national network surrounded by mostly local TV news. Um, there's four local television stations in San Diego. OAN, I, I believe, is the only national one based here. So we're, we're aware of what our peers are doing, but there wasn't a lot of direct competition in the market. So what made you want to write the book? Um, so 
early 2019, I think my last day there was January 3rd, 2019. And it really changed like my outlook on media um, just because I had been taught by, like you said, some of the purists, some of the people who use terms like the fifth estate. Um, mm -hmm. And I went into OAN thinking that this is going to be radically different from what I've experienced. And the politics of OANN are very different, but what I wrapped the book up saying is I noticed a lot of similarities in like how business is conducted, um, how powerful people. Similarities are. between what? To, to talk, talk about who you saying is, is similar. Yeah. So we talk a lot of, or you on your show talk a lot about how corporations influence like the amount of information that's available. Um, like mm -hmm. trying to come up with an example off the top of my head, but powerful people, people who own, there's six networks that own virtually everything that people watch on TV and hmm. they're all publicly traded companies. They all have similar type of values based on, you know, the people they hire they tend to be very educated people. You know, there aren't a lot of union reps coming on the Sunday shows. And that's because no, they, of course not. They, do, they do business the same way. Whether you're watching MSNBC, CNN, they're drawing from the same pool of workers and the same pool of information, if that makes sense. They're covering the same things and they're hiring the same people. And that wasn't too different from OANN. Um, and at the, um, the networks. And Describe like the 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 relationship with 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 Big Bad Daddy Trump, uh, you know, because, um, you know, obviously, I think like there was a lot of in the run up to Trump's election, um, there was a lot of talk of, oh, social media disinformation. This is why people are kind of, quote unquote, getting tricked uh, by him. Uh, Russians bots are on Facebook mm -hmm. or whatever the fuck. Um to me, the reality was always that like Trump's popularity was in large part driven by TV. Like good TV news drives so much more of, of of public opinion and all that stuff than than the internet does. Um, and obviously, you know, like Fox News' influence on the American right is kind of outsized and all that stuff. But uh, how was the how how was OANN's relationship to Trump, and how did you guys cover him? Yeah. Anytime he was in front of a microphone, we would drop whatever we were doing. And he, he, had, he had, he, he, it was him at the podium. Um, oh, so you guys and, were like CNN that way. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> the difference. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but to, to my earlier point, um, you, I'm sure both of you remember like late 2015 when Trump was becoming a serious candidate. A lot of the networks did the same thing. If he was oh, talking... Yeah. If he was talking, his face was on the screen. Because... Famously, they would just show the podium before he even mm -hmm. showed up. They would just podium. Trump's about to speak. This is primetime, um, basically newsworthy. Because it generated interest. Um, mm -hmm. But in my opinion, you can follow something that's generating interest and cover it responsibly. And I, I don't think the major networks did that. And yeah. to mm -hmm. Nando's point, that's what really influenced the the. American political spectrum leading up to 2016. Yeah, Les Moonves, there's a famous quote, Les Moonves, he's a longtime chairman of CBS, which is the number one network uh, on on broadcast. You know, they, they're, they're always the top ratings uh, network on broadcast. Uh, he had a famous quote, he said, you know, Trump, you know, horrible for the, con for the country, great for CBS. Uh, and yeah. famously, <laughs> CNN, in the Trump era, was posting record ratings, record profits, uh, I mean, over a billion dollars a year in profit for CNN during Trump years, which is just bought mind boggling. That's boxing, crazy. Right. You know, that, profit. That is, you know, that is insane revenue. that a news, yeah. that a, a quote unquote news operation could even right. do that type of revenue. And to, or to profit. Here, I think this is the main point that I try to make in the book. Um, it's, People in news have benefited a lot from these past few years. COVID, oh, yeah. Trump, George Floyd. It's been, <laughs> we get a lot of eyeballs. And oh, yeah. in my opinion, and what you're taught in J school, um, when they talk about the, you know, the purity of, the, of what your responsibilities are, you're taught that you serve the public. 
And yeah. in my experience, that just isn't the case. Um, I saw someone on Twitter after the Buffalo shooting made a really good observation. He said, the news focuses so much on what just happened that even things that happened a few months ago that were important become a distant memory. And it's really hard for people to be well-informed, to organize, to, to vote responsibly when you don't have a good picture of even the last yeah. six months. No, one of my, one of my spicier, one of my spicier takes is that like, you know, just journalism and, and capitalist competition are basically um, incompatible, incompatible, fully yep. incompatible that, you know, when people think of kind of the golden age of American news, which is always kind of nostalgia tinged and whatever, but it, it is it's, probably it's, it's the news. Walter Cronkite shit. Yeah, <laughs> but that stuff is it. But but people don't understand is that in those days, the news operations of the networks were lost leaders, basically mm. by law. So the when the American government gave these private corporations the airwaves or the right to use the airwaves, the one concession they extracted was that there would be a at the same time every day um, a news hour that they that they had to by law uh, deliver the news. They didn't they didn't want to deliver the news because they would rather be playing fucking sitcoms or whatever. Like all these things are like are better ratings, and the news is expensive and and not as good in, in terms of ratings. But they had to by law in order to have the public airwaves. Um, this was something that the government demanded. The news networks were proudly at the time massive loss leaders. Like they were not chasing profit. They they were almost proud of the fact that they lost tens of millions of dollars a year for the networks. Um, that was kind of stripped away in the 1980s. Uh, that that law was stripped away in the 1980s. The networks then decided we're going to keep the news, but they have to be profit centers, you know. Yeah. Um, and that that kind of they have to be vehicles by which we can sell dick pic. Dick, exactly. dick pills exactly. uh you can get dick exactly. pics for free um so but <laughs> a warp incentive for the kinds of news for the kind of news that you come that you that you covered the way you tell it you know you you out the sensationalism the drama mm -hmm. all that stuff because you're competing now um right. and so that's why i always think like the, the the only way forward for a kind of healthy journalistic society is to have some sort of public funding for news that is that is devoid from the from the profit motive but yeah. right um nando you made the point about the kind of the base of what broadcast news was changing in the 80s i mentioned earlier six companies own virtually everything people in america watch a lot of that consolidation if you track it starts to happen in the in the yeah. 80s 90s 2000s so that when when it becomes more profitable that's when a lot of that consolidation started to happen. Yeah. I want to talk about Papa Trump a little bit more. Um, For sure. Obviously, a figure like <sighs> the Republicans had had in front of the show facts. The <laughs> Republicans hadn't had a rock star since Reagan. Right. Like nobody gave a fuck about poppy bush for sure yeah. i think w was pretty well liked by republicans but he so he was thoroughly by 9 11 he was boosted by 9 11 yeah right there you go but then by the end of it he was so thoroughly proven to be an idiot nincompoop that like he had no swagger and appeal and right. then of course you know people like mccain and romney who are just like straight up Rhinos, the, like the, the, the base of the party, the animated force of the party was like, these cats are not actual Republicans. We don't believe in these cats. So Trump is like a bona fide rock star within the party in a way that Reagan was, um, which makes sense when you consider they were both celebrities. Um, what What is the network's relationship by the time you get there with Trump? Is it like, we know this guy's watching our shit. Or is it like um, we're we're literally <laughs> serving Trump and his and his audience, right? Like not these country club motherfucking good old boy network Republicans. Is is Trump and his audience? Yeah. So I'm trying to look up the exact page to kind of tease this, but there is an interaction <laughs> that I so page 36 for anyone who goes and cop the book. There is an interaction between Trump and the owner of the network, Robert Herring Sr. Um, during my time there. 
Trump had been going to podiums in press conferences and saying that he watched OANN. Wow. Um, so he was one, promoting this shit. There was one case where I was in the newsroom and we're taking the live feed um, from the White House. We have a correspondent there. And Trump like personally calls out the OANN correspondent, says, you get a question. And <laughs> everyone in the newsroom is kind of like reacting to that. And uh, it's kind of funny. It's kind of funny. Um, he Trump had said that OANN was one of the only networks that treated him fairly. And <laughs> so ownership, right. ownership tries to leverage that into an exclusive, a sit down. Um, he visited San Diego to check out the border. Um, this was when, you know, the wall was a popular idea. Um, mm -hmm. Shouts to the wall. Tried, they tried to get him in studio. They're trying to leverage that relationship like that could be, you know, major for them. And Trump just kind of keeps sidestepping them and. uh Robert Herring Sr. goes on his Twitter account and says, uh, literally says, I'm calling bullshit on you, Trump. You, you're not, you know, you're not coming through and, and and plugging us like you like you do at the podium. So I'm calling bullshit on you. Like his his feelings were hurt. And then um, Trump in the following months tweeted that ONN was his favorite network again. And the uh, the bullshit tweet was has since been deleted. And what what was like, you know, you talked about the Roy Moore one. That one's pretty funny and egregious. Mm -hmm. But what was like some of the craziest stories from your in your mind of, um, that that you saw that not necessarily that you worked on, but you just saw someone else work on or or aired on the network? Like, what would be like? Was there anything that kind of was really shocking? Um. Yeah, there were conversations had. Like I said earlier, conversations had openly in the newsroom that you just you couldn't coming from a conventional background you couldn't believe um in sacramento there was a police killing a man named stefan clark in 2018 and somebody told me because you know I'm, I'm a news guy i'm pitching stories on what's going on in the country and one of the anchors told me just straight up we're, we're not covering anything where the police could be seen as doing something wrong um and then about an hour later when those demonstrations on behalf of Stefan Clark uh, start to turn violent, someone comes in the newsroom and says, we can use this, you know, like this is, this is a propaganda opportunity. And those things were just discussed openly. I, I have a case in the book where I used a quote from, um, I believe the gentleman's name is Ralph Northam in uh, Virginia. Yeah. yeah. He had basically said Trump tweets too much. Very, throwaway quote, something that everyone was saying five years ago. And I use that quote for a sound and a producer comes by and tells me, hey, we're going to take that out. You know, we, we don't we don't include anything on the airwaves that's anti-Trump. And these discussions, like I wasn't pulled into an office. I wasn't reprimanded. It was just openly stated. Matter of fact. Yeah, these, yeah, this is how things are done here. Yeah, because, you know, I, I always talk about there is absolutely a bias in mainstream American news, right? right. There is, there is, it, but the way it's enforced is not so much, you know, like there's a, there's, they, they, they know not to just kind of like openly in the newsroom to say like, Oh, you can't do that. You know what I mean? Right. Um, it's a little bit more, uh, a, first of all, like, people kind of can sense it and then they kind of go in the right direction and then they get promoted. You know what I mean? Like the, the right people who believe the right things are the ones that get promoted. If you're a critic of U S foreign policy or whatever, like it's not like someone's going to come in and say like, you know, you should, you shouldn't talk about that stuff, but you just won't get on the air. You just won't, your stories won't get accepted. They won't like, they'll always find at, the end of the, at the end of the book, I have a chapter called left wing, which is basically just a, a critique of some of the places I've worked in the past. And I, I, list a few cases where I pitched things that were, as you said, critical of American foreign policy or local police departments or whatnot. And yeah. they just don't get on air. Um, it's, very get rare, on air. it's very rare that those pitches get approved. And it's because those pitches don't get on air, you know, the, the, the sort of true believers get weeded out, right? Because eventually they get tired, they, they, they right. get frustrated and they leave. And then the ones that are pitching stuff that does get on air, it's because they don't give a shit about that other stuff. Right. Like they, 
they get promoted. They just keep getting promoted. And then so then the people in leadership are all the people who believe the correct things already. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like it's when you talk about bias in American news, people are like, oh, come on. It's not like it's not like someone is coming down and giving orders. And no, it's not. It's just it's everybody thinks cool. the exact same way. <laughs> they don't even realize it. They're like fish in water. Uh, it, there's like the also, famous change. Yeah. Yeah. It's also I think it's important to note there's a, a filtering in the hiring process. Uh, Waz and I were chatting before we, we went live with the show today and I was telling him I went to college. I didn't graduate. I just kind of found my way to the industry in an unconventional way. And I don't mean to toot my own horn, but I think there's a reason that I'm the person writing this book. Uh, a lot of my peers are college graduates, Berkeley, uh, Columbia, mm -hmm. you know, you're pulling from a very specific pool of people and there's already kind of an ideological programming, social yeah. leanings. You, you don't need to give directives. Yeah. <laughs> there's, a, there's a class bias. I mean, it, you, yeah. news uh, journalism used to be a working class. Hell yeah. Profession. You know what I mean? That's like, to my man, Jimmy news, Breslin, man. Yeah. Yeah. Like a, a newspaper <laughs> man in the 1970s was like the crusty, you know, cigarette smoking guy. Like he wasn't like a polished, uh, you know, high society type. Very rare. Was it Dr. Yeah. Carlson? No, he wasn't. <laughs> no. I mean, yeah. yes, there was the Washington Post and like those, you know, there were some people there that were definitely, but like if you were at the Cleveland Plain Dealer, which like you was were a, just a regular dude, time, you yep. were just like some fucking regular Joe. Um, and a lot of, a lot now, of papers are closing too. Papers that where those types of employees get, can be hired, they're not as profitable anymore. So they are closing. Yeah. No, and, and, and now, like, the, the sort of few news outlets that kind of remain are these big national ones or the New York Times or, you know, CNN, all that stuff. Um, and those people all definitely come from extremely elite backgrounds. Like, the vast majority of them are just extremely elite backgrounds. And that that creates its own kind of mm. class bias that is just, you just, you know, obviously there's always some people who are, you know, a little different or whatever. But for the most part, on a structural level, it's, it's um, they all believe the same stuff. Yeah. Man, JP, I'm, I really want to thank you for coming on today, but I want you to tell the people, like, if you could distill what you would want them to get out of the book and the, 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 the general message about what they're consuming in news, how they're consuming it, what would you want people to know about this alleged left-right divide in the media, um, et cetera? I would say if you want better information, you're going to have to take a more active role in mm. where you get it. Um, I get into that at the end of the book. Um, list a few sources that I personally started with. Shouts, shouts to you for listening uh, to Woke Bros is yes. one of those yeah. sources. The greatest, news source, the greatest source, news news source in, in the history of podcasts. Um, but yeah, it's kind of like, Waz, I have a very similar political journey to you. I was just a mm. standard, like, black liberal. Libtard. Black yeah, yeah, yeah. Northern black California, libtard. Very liberal. And I just found my way to some of these alternative sources. And mm -hmm. you want to be careful. You know, you don't want to be getting news from Reddit. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you need to be careful yeah. with, with, you might end up on a Dr. Sabi diet if, exactly. if you don't right. be you, careful enough. Yeah. You don't, you don't want to end up talking like Kyrie, but, uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> but you do want to, you know, cut, cut the TV off after, after the weather and traffic and, and go try to mm -hmm. find your, your political news and, and, the people who inform your thinking in, on some alternative place. Read some books. You don't. You don't always mm. need to be concerned with what's breaking today. Facts. Hey man, tell the people where they could find you. Uh, your work is incredible. I don't just say that because you're a fan of what we do here and you're on our show. Really fuck with what you do. Um, tell the people where they can find you and your work, bro. Yeah. So um, the main place you'll find me is on Twitter. My at is J P Gowell. J A Y. The letter P. G E W E L, and my book. Uh, the link to the Amazon is pinned at the top of my Twitter feed, and if I and if it's going to be in the link of this show. Yep, yeah. And when I write other things for magazines, newspapers, whatnot, it's it's always Twitter feed is the best place to find me. I love it, man. Um, thank you again for coming on today. It's been a long time coming. Again, the book is Right Wing, What I Saw, Heard, and Learned Working in President Donald Trump's Favorite Newsroom. Go get that. 
Amazon, all of that, wherever you get get the book. Um, we'll see you guys next week. Peace out, y'all. Appreciate you, Later. bro. All right, man. Good shit, JP. Appreciate you, bro. Take it easy. Yeah, thanks. thanks. Peace. Peace.